the book of uh, Second Corinthians and the 12th chapter, there is a word that uh, I feel led to share with you this morning. Uh, I've been struggling as to what God will have me to share with you all week. I really have. And uh, there was a word there, a very familiar passage of scripture recorded in 2 Corinthians and the 12th chapter. And when you have 2 Corinthians chapter 12, for the benefit of brevity and the sake of our subject, we're going to look at one verse, and that's going to be verse number 7. If you stand with me as we read 2 Corinthians 12 and verse number 7. Thank you for standing. I wanted everybody to stand. In a moment, you're going to be seated. And so by you standing, when I ask you to stand, that means that nobody will be able to leave here saying that the preacher didn't move me. <laughs> so it takes a whole lot of pressure off me. Just by you standing, amen. So I feel a whole lot better already, amen. Pressure's relieved, amen. Somewhat. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Listen to the word of God. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Let me read that again. And lest I should be exalted above measure. Through the abundance of the revelations that was given to me, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. That was given to me, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I should be exalted above that was given to me a thorn in the flesh the messenger of Satan to buffet me I want to talk this morning simply from this thought when Satan blesses you when Satan blesses you. Look at somebody and say, neighbor, there are times in all of our lives when the devil can bless you. When Satan blesses you. Without a doubt, the premier enemy of the redeemed is none other than our adversary himself. Whether Jesus was referring to those false religious leaders or directly or evil indirectly, scripture clearly articulates the mission statement of the demonic. For well, the enemy's job is threefold in that he comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. There's nothing lovely from the character of Satan. There's nothing exemplary in the countenance of our enemy. enemy our enemy is without a doubt the premier foe for those of us who are called to ministry yet for some reason or another it seems that the further we move from that period called antiquity into this period which is called postmodernity, it is vividly clear that the rational and the enlightened mind has now begun to deny denounce and even in many instances discredit the reality or even the thought of the demonic. Poll was recently done of Americans which suggested that over 70% of Americans express some type of belief in God, but less than 35% believe in the reality of a demonic realm. 
for some reason or another, the more educated we become, the more seminary training we're able to ascertain. It seems that any references to the demonic seems like an antiquated and an annotated and outdated idea. Even the saints of God have now begun to take on some Baltimanian tendencies in that we attempt to demythologize scripture in so much that we have demythologized the enemy out of the scriptures and even out of our own lives. There are others who suggest that the reason why the faith community has to propagate the idea of the demonic is because we need something or someone to blame for our own infirmities and dysfunction. And so the talk of the demonic, the talk of evil, allows us to feel better about our own maladies and it allows us to never take responsibility for the plights that we have created in our own sojourns. For some, they suggest that any talk about Satan is some abstract metaphysical ambiguity. Satan is some fictitious mythological character perpetrated by the faith community because what we've done, in the words of Elaine Pagels, is we have allowed the talk about Satan to allow us to demonize those who become our own human adversaries. And so we need Satan in order to start wars. We need Satan in order to justify our own pathologies about our heterosexuality. We need Satan to continue our ability to compartmentalize and segregate societies based on dogmas of milieus. And so if there's anything that we don't like, if there's somebody who asks a question of us about our vision as pastors, we are easy to relegate that as the demonic. When it could very well be a great question that is based on a vision that makes no sense and a plan that has no substance. It's so often in our own lives in an attempt to justify who we like and what we like. We need Satan because Satan makes us feel good about these ecclesiastical caste systems that we have in church and even in society. Brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell us that while many believe that we should not worship God and bring any talk to Satan, I want to suggest that I still believe that Satan is real. I know that many enlightened minds and there are many scholars around the house this morning who will think that this conversation lacks the ability to be cognitive and intellectual that how dare you stand before us in such a scholastic gathering to talk about the demonic. We thought that you been trained. We thought that you've been to school. Let's talk about social justice. Let's, let's talk about the ills that affect us societally. How dare you insult our intelligence? We've been to Hampton. We've been to Howard. We've been to Harvard. We've been to Virginia Union. We've been to Morehouse. We've been to Shaw. We've been to Princeton and Yale. How dare you stand before us? the centennial gathering of the Hamptons Ministers Conference and talk about the demonic. What's wrong with you, preacher? Well, I've discovered that most people who have issues with any talk about Satan, who have attempted to deny the reality of Satan, to make Satan become simply some first century understanding that is based on Flavius Josephus's articulation of the wars of the Jewish wars there in the first century and from that time on how we as Christians have sometimes used Satan to demonize the Jews and how the Jews have used Satan to perhaps demonize us and we've used Satan to demonize one another but I understand that many scholars who talk about 
the lack of reality of Satan. They say that simply because they are professors, but they've spent no time in pastoring. Because if I can be honest with you, nearly 25 years of pastoring have taught me that there is a thing called the demonic. I think somebody else knows what I'm talking about here. It's amazing to me how pastors and scholars no longer believe in the reality of the enemy, but, but, enemy, but even those of the pagan world acknowledge the reality of the demonic it's an ancient near eastern mindset that they feel that the entire cosmos was permeated with the presence of evil Zoroaster there in the sixth century bc in iran Zoroaster, who did not believe that a messiah was going to come some six centuries later to restore israel back to a place of prominence prestige and popularity but Zoroaster did espouse an equality and he did espouse some sense of centrality between the forces of good and evil. Zoroaster, who did not believe that Jesus would come, but he did believe that good and evil were two juxtaposing and contradicting forces. With evil having no ultimate power over good or good having no ultimate power over evil. Brothers and sisters, even those of the pagan world. The ancient Egyptians often felt that sometimes evil was simply the absence of what they call none or the absence of good. Wherever God is not present, wherever light is not present, it is in that intrinsic darkness. Perhaps there is the reality of the demonic. But we don't have to look for professors or scholars or pagan societies to understand the reality of the demonic, I believe, still in biblical authority. I do believe that the scriptures are man's best attempt to define what God says to us. And in the Old Testament, there are seven books in the Old Testament that have an explicit reference to the demonic. Uh, Satan or evil, the devil is mentioned in every book of the New Testament. There are 29 different passages in the Gospels where the demonic or the, or the satanic is mentioned. And out of those 29 different occasions, all I'm trying to tell you is that Jesus was speaking on 25 of those 29 different occasions. And so I know that you have more letters perhaps than a thermometer behind your name. But it matters not how big the Bible is you tote or how many scriptures you quote. I've seen evil. I've seen evil attack people. I've seen people battle with evil. I've seen people who are affected by the demonic. I still believe that evil is real. And yet as evil is real and as evil's job is to kill, steal, and destroy, it seems, if that is the case, Brother Preacher, that your sermon is almost perplexing. That it seems somewhat blasphemous and heretical and even unorthodox to suggest that evil and Satan can have blessing capacity. I thought that every good and every perfect gift that it came from above. I thought the old saints in the senior choir would sing with the regularity that the Lord is blessing me right now. He woke me up this morning and started me on my way and then they get redundant about it. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord is blessing me. Have I witnessed here? Right now. Well, brother preacher, if every good and every perfect gift comes from above and if Satan's or evil's job is to kill, steal and destroy, if, e if evil is the absence of none or the absence of good, then how in the world can you suggest here sermonically that Satan has blessing capacities? My sisters and my brothers, I want to suggest to us this morning that sometimes even in the activity of the enemy, because of the sovereignty of God, that there are times in all of our lives when Satan is most operative, when evil is most apparent in our lives, that sometimes the evil and even the satanic and the demonic can unintentionally contribute to the propagation of blessing rather than burden. 
I'm here to tell you there are times in our lives when it seems that the enemy wants to bother, badger, bruise, and burden us. That the enemy unintentionally takes us to another levels of blessings to understand the glorious dynamics of God's benevolence. I'm here to tell you that sometimes when you're facing the most heinous and the most, the most horrific moment, that is at that time that your faith in God can literally be raised to another level. No, nowhere in the Bible is this point of preachment more clearly demonstrated than it is demonstrated in our text this morning. At the time of this text, the penman of this text is that guy whose name was Paul. He's Saul, the tent maker from Tarsus, a member of that Pharisee party, that party which had arisen in the early second century BC to protest the fact that the military leaders had been nominated as the high priest. That sect had arisen in protest to the fact of the secularization of the sacred high priest office. And so they believed in a strict adherence to the law, the Mishnah, the Pentateuch, and the Torah. This was the particular party to whom Saul belonged. He was a member of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. He had gone to the prep schools of Palestine, studied at the University of Jerusalem, was tutored at the feet of the rabbi Gamaliel. The first time we see this guy, Saul, Luke tells us about him in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts. As those Jews, those religionists from Jerusalem, decided to throw rocks to assassinate the first deacon of the church, Deacon Stephen. It was a young man by the name of Saul, who did not throw one stone, but served as the maitre d' holding the coast of those men who did. Following the execution of Deacon Stephen, he went around chapter 8 of Acts like a wild boar, making havoc, that phrase illuminato, like a wild pig, locking up anybody who was a part of this movement called the way. He secured letters from the high priest was on his way to a place called Damascus to eliminate and stagnate this movement that has been built in honor of the curious Christos. And on the street called Straight, after saddling his horse, going to Damascus to hunt the church of the Lord Jesus. On his way toward Damascus, the hunter became the hunted. God knocked him off of his horse and changed him from a hell raiser to a heaven's praiser. Blinded him temporarily and then changed his name from Saul to Paul. It was this Paul who was properly credentialed by the church of Jerusalem after spending a time to certify his own connection with the divine. And he was sent along with Barnabas uh, to spread the gospel to Asia Minor and Europe. It was this Paul now who goes along with Barnabas and Barnabas' nephew John Mark to spread the gospel throughout Europe and they got down there in the mountainous regions of Pamphylia. John Mark, who was a coward soldier, couldn't handle the difficulty of ministry and returned back home to Jerusalem with his mama, Mary. Paul and Barnabas finished the first journey together, and then when they got ready to go out the second time, Barnabas wanted to take his nephew, John Mark, again. Uh, Paul said, we don't need any little liver, jelly-backed men to be on this missionary journey. This is a battlefield. Not about how nice your manicure can be and how sweet your shoes can be. Shine. This is a war. And as a result of their differences of opinion, Barnabas and Paul split ways. And John Mark went with Barnabas to do ministry. And then Paul chose a fellow by the name of Silas to finish up the second and the third missionary journeys. It was this same Paul. Picks up his quail and parchments and delivers this pericope to us this morning. He is talking about himself, but he speaks in third person. He says, for I knew a man about 14 years ago. Uh, this man, I don't know what it was. Was it an in the body or an out of the body experience? But I knew a man who was so sovereignly blessed by Jehovah that he received a pre-eschatological rapture. He was raptured up there into the third heavens. He saw the abode of Christ and the deceased saints. He got an apocalyptic view of some things that are going to take place futuristically and prophetically in the future. He said, I saw the abode of Christ. I saw third heavens. It was an interesting view. It was a sovereign blessing because although I was that apostle, 
the least of these, the one born out of due season. I saw some thing that was so glorious. I saw some thing that was so wondrous that it's not even lawful for me to utter. I saw some stuff that Thomas couldn't see, that Matthew couldn't see, that Peter couldn't see, that Bartholomew couldn't see. Although I was not there with them, I saw some stuff that I can't even tell you. It was a sovereign blessing. Although I was just on earth, he showed me where I was going. I saw paradise. I, I saw the abode of Christ and the deceased saints. It was a glorious apocalyptic view. It was a sovereign blessing. He says, but as soon as I made the descent, back down from glory, back down to earth, from the celestial, back down to the terrestrial. When I was caught up, he says, that was a sovereign blessing. When I came back down to the terrestrial, that was waiting for me, a terrestrial blessing. He says, when I got back down to earth, the devil messed around and he blessed me. Me being caught up, a sovereign blessing. Me coming back down to earth, a satanic blessing. He told me to tell you that the devil can unintentionally bless you. And some of you have been rebuking the enemy. And God told me to tell you by the time you leave this message in the next 20 minutes, that you'll go back home tomorrow or Saturday not rebuking the enemy, but thanking the enemy. And so I came this morning to help add one phrase to your own ecclesiastical vocabularies. We hear thank you Jesus, but I want you to say thank you devil. I want you to have the ability to look at the enemy and look at evil, to look at the absence of none. And the most horrific attack that you faced as a leader that you'll be able to look at it and say, you know what, that really was the devil, Satan, blessing me. Well, Paul, some of these folk think my blood pressure is acting up. Can you help me theologically here? How in the world, what happens, man, that gives me some homiletical liberty to say that the devil and evil and Satan can sometimes be a blessing? Paul told me to tell you that sometimes... You will know when the enemy is blessing you and when evil is blessing you, number one, get this, because there will be the reception of a special gift. There will be the reception of a special gift. He says, that was given to me. I didn't ask for it. I didn't pay for it. I didn't earn it. That was given to me. And the fact that it was given to me makes it a gift. That was given to me, it is a thorn in the flesh. That was given to me, he says in Greek, a scallops in my socks. It was a dagger in my flesh. It was an excruciatingly painful dagger in my anatomy. It was a painful condition that was placed in my flesh. Now there's a measure of inconclusivity regarding the exact nature of this thorn. Some have suggested that perhaps Paul's thorn was a chronic uh, condition of the eye called chronic ophthalmia, right. a dreadful eye condition that led to mucus chronically and profusely flowing from the apostles' optic membranes. Maybe it was an eye condition. Some others have suggested that perhaps Paul's thorn was pain over a previous divorce. Some others have suggested that maybe Paul's thorn was a struggle with his own sexuality. That maybe even Paul was dealing with some homosexual proclivities. Some others have suggested that maybe his thorn was the fact that he was physically unattractive. We are uncertain as to exact identity of the thorn, but we do know who bequeathed it to him. It was the messenger of Satan. It was one of Satan's emissaries that had been sent from the agency of hell to afflict Paul with this excruciatingly painful condition in his flesh. It was his pain. It was his pain. He received a special gift which was painful. And I'm talking to somebody right now that's been given to you. 
a thorn in the flesh. You didn't ask for the church. It was given to you. That has been given to you, a rebellious and cantankerous trustee board. You didn't select them. When you got there, they were given to you. That's been somebody who's been given a rebellious stepchild. You didn't create them just by marriage. Come on, help me here, somebody. That was given to you. And here is my reality. Uh, when Satan gave Paul this special thorn, the enemy thought that this special gift, which was his pain, that it was going to destroy Apostle Paul. But can I tell you, sometimes when the enemy thinks that he's going to destroy you by hurting you, the hurts really don't destroy you, they really develop you. I, I want to talk to somebody because there are some hurting preachers around here this morning. Don't believe that just because they have a nice suit on, a nice dress on, that everything is well. Somebody has to go back to some painful conditions in ministry. It's painful to go back and have vision up to here, but provision down to here. It's painful to go back and have a heart for the community, but the community does not have a heart for what you're trying to do. That's a painful condition. There's some ministers here who are trying to self-medicate because they think that that pain is going to destroy them. But I came to tell you that even if you're in pain, and even if evil is the source of your pain, Lift your hand up and tell God, thank you. Because sometimes your hurts are not there to really hurt you. They were there in the end. It'll turn out and it'll help you. Thank you, devil. Because whenever the devil blesses, there'll be the reception of a special gift. Oh, but not only when the devil blesses you, will there be the reception of a special gift, which is your pain. But there also will be, get this now, the removal of self-glory. The removal of self-glory. Listen to that and how, and how he commences and concludes verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure. Look how he closes verse 7. Lest I should be exalted above measure. He said, you know what happened to me when I was caught up there into the third heaven? I saw some stuff. I saw so much. It was an abundance of the revelations. He says, and here is the reality. The enemy really made a bad mistake. Because the abundance of the revelations, if those things would have been left alone without any subsequent attack, the abundance of the revelations could have led me to having an arrogant and egotistic perspective of myself. Because sometimes abundance and an afflu affluence has a way of changing who we are. E. Franklin Frazier in his book called The Black Bourgeoisie suggests that sometimes the higher we climb the corporate and the social, economic, and educational ladders, sometimes the higher we climb in the higher we climb in economics, the higher we climb in education, the less we go in terms of reverence and worship and appreciation to God. I want to suggest that the worst thing the enemy should have done to Paul was to give him a thorn. Because if Paul had not given him the thorn, if the enemy had not left uh, uh, Paul with the thorn, if the enemy would have allowed him just to have a mega ministry of revelation, if he had not messed with him by giving him the thorn after he bought his first bins, if he had not given Paul the thorn after he was able to order three suits at the conference, if God had not allowed the enemy to give Paul a thorn, then the abundance of what he received may have got him caught up so much in pride that he walks around the conference like he's smelling people. Because he has 500 members, because he's got an American Express card, because now he thinks he has arrived, because abundance and affluence has gone to his head. And that's the problem with a lot of us. God has given abundance of gifts, abundance of revelations, and yet if there's no subsequent attack, we can mount the pulpit as if it's all about us. But you know what happened? When the enemy gave Paul the thorn, 
the thorn remove self glory thank you devil because if you had not messed with me by hurting me, I may have gotten so insular, I may have gotten so narcissistic that I thought that ministry was about me and the church couldn't go on without me. Thank you, devil, for hurting me because through your hurts, your hurts remove self-glory. Don't you ever allow the gifts God gave you. To make you think more highly than you ought. The Bible said that God resisted the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. The Bible said that pride goes just before destruction. And the reason why so many of our ministers are falling. Perhaps it's because pride and arrogance have taken over the church. theologies proud in our patriarchy proud in our acceptance of uh, heterosexuals but, but our condemnation of those who are unlike us but oh when, when evil comes when you got to go through something that's painful when it's your daughter that's pregnant and she's a teenager. When it's your marriage that's in trouble. The same preacher who used to point the finger of school at others will discover now three are pointing back at you. The higher God takes you. Don't you let the abundance of revelations make you think more highly of yourself than you ought. But you all start saying what I am, he made me. Thank you, devil. Because even though you told me to humble myself, and that's why I don't pray, Lord, humble me. And you ought not pray, Lord, humble me. Ask Nebuchadnezzar how it feels when the Lord humbles you. So God says, I'm even being gracious to you. By allowing the enemy to send you a thorn. Because his humbling may be less intense than mine. Humble yourself. I want to go higher in ministry. I want to do this. I want to be on the platform. How do I go higher in ministry? It's simple. It ain't deep. You don't need seminary education to figure it out. Go to seminary, but it's not deep. You want to go higher? It's simple. Exalt yourself, you'll be jacked up. Lower yourself, you'll be exalted. Case closed, let's go home. Sir, the communion. It's simple. So if it's so simple, why we walk around? What's up, Doc? What's up, Doc? What's your name, Doc? And with this old preacher talking, talk to the side. Man, put your hand down. Get out my face. What's my name? E. Dewey Smith. That's what my mama called me. That's what my birth certificate. That's what my social security number. If you need a title to make you, you ain't nothing in the first place. Over yourself. So God God said I have to let the devil bless you because there will be removal of self glory that's your pride whenever the devil blesses you that will be number one the reception of a special gift that's your pain that will be the removal of self glory that's your pride but thirdly when the devil blesses you that will be get this now the resolution to speak with God verse 8 for this thing for what thing Paul for this scallops in the massarks 
for this dagger in my anatomy. I besought the Lord with a trilogy of supplication. Thank you, devil. Because you thought that giving a preacher bipolar would make him run to the bottle. You thought that allowing suffering would make us all suicidal. But thank you, devil. Because after the thorn, we didn't write a resignation letter. We're not going to self-medicate. But because of your attacks, now we can have an affinity with divinity. Now we can have a hookup with the holy. Now we can have interaction with the infinite. We can have dialogue with deity. Thank you, devil. Because what you did with the thorn, it is now through your thorn that we recognize that the thorn room is the way to the throne room. Somebody help me preach around here. As a matter of fact, what you've done by attacking me is you've, in actuality, brought me closer to God. If you would have left me alone, I may have gotten disconnected in my own egotism and elitism. But because of your attacks, I'm closer to God than I ever been since I got hell in the church. Since the offering been down, I've been praying more. I've been studying more. Thank you, devil. I'm on the prayer call with Dr. Curtis and Dr. Guns on Sunday morning to go before God's people now because I got hell on my track. For some of us before, the devil gave you a blessing. Preaching was perfunctory. You simply study to prepare a message. And if you're studying to prepare a message, that's work, not spending time with God. Oh yeah, before you went through that trouble, before the evil got in the ministry, here was your weekend agenda. Every Saturday night at 11.30, go on the internet, find some anointed YouTube clip to copy. Or find some sermon site and press copy, print and pick it from the printer and take it straight to the pulpit becoming an ecclesiastical plagiarist can I help you here? God don't anoint counterfeits and that's why there's no power in the church because things are going well but oh, let some hell break out It'll bring you back to the altar. It'll make you snot and cry for sermon impetus. It'll make you snot and cry. Give me a word. Thank you, devil. My prayer life. How many of us preachers don't even pray? We so good with our craft that we can look at a text, know which tools to use, put it together in your routine on Sunday, have it printed out, and go with your own power because of your gift. There have been times I had every, I dotted every T crossed, and I thought that horse was going to ride like secretariat. Mounted God's desk full of myself, confident in my own abilities, and fell right on my face. Died like Methuselah. But some other times, so discombobulated by ministry, trying to do the best I can. Got up there without sure myself, voice broken. I'm just doing the best that I can to hear from God and wasn't confident. But it was in that moment. I wish I had somebody to talk to me. It was in that moment when I felt I was at my lowest, but because I was closer to God. So when you go back home, tell your boards that 
are not with you. Thank you. Tell your denomination I appreciate you. Because it only means that if evil, not something that you've named evil, because it, but I mean real evil that's trying to keep you from your purpose, that simply means that you're, you're getting ready to go higher. And you got to thank God for that attack because you can't go higher if you don't have something or someone to step on. Because he makes your enemies. I wish I had somebody help me. Your footstool. That's why if you got attacked against you, something you know God gave you, don't fuss back. Don't fight back. That was the time my young ministry, when somebody came against me and I knew it was God, I looked for my Glock. I looked for my nine, my nunchucks. I had to go Taekwondo on a Negro. But no longer, no longer, because I know when the devil is trying to attack me, this is what I do. I wash my hands, I get some hand sanitizer, I get me a handkerchief and put it around my neck. Because whenever it's real evil attacking me, it's just authentication and verification and confirmation that I'm getting ready to eat some filet mignon. And some Chateaubriand. And if you ain't careful, I'll chase it down with some Don Perignon because he prepares a table before you. I wish I had somebody help me. Can somebody testify? He prepares a table before you. In the presence of my enemy. And so, thank you, devil. Because there's the reception of a special gift. That's my pain. Because you've been messing with me, there's been the removal of self-glory. That's my pride. Because you've been messing with me, devil, there's been the resolution to speak with God. That's my prayer. But then fourth and finally, whenever the devil blesses you, whenever evil blesses you, not only would that be the reception of a special gift, the removal of self-glory, the resolution to speak with God, but fourth and finally, that will be the recognition of sustaining grace. Listen to this conversation between creature and creator. Paul goes to God. God! Will you move this storm? Paul says that to God. God says back to Paul, no, Paul. That's a good hermeneutic for some of us who name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, call it and haul it. No, Paul. Paul goes back to God. God! I thought I just could speak it in the atmosphere. Why won't you move? my thorn God says back to Paul Paul I can't move it because you're doing all right with it over half the New Testament is gonna be attributed to your authorship with it you're gonna finish three missionary journeys with it you're establishing churches all over Asia Minor with it you speak in tongues more than anybody else with it you're mentoring younger preachers with it i'm not gonna move it you're humble with it you're praying with it i'm not gonna move it you're doing too good with it this is a case of what h richard niebuhr the brother Reinhold Niebuhr. H. Richard Niebuhr once said, there are times in the life of the believer that God will intentionally become our enemy in order to anthropomorphically become our friend. He allows the enemy to attack Paul. He becomes his enemy. But in becoming his enemy, he simultaneously becomes his friend. He says, Paul, I will not make 
an extraction, but I will make a deposit. My grace. My charis, my favor. I won't move, remove your frustration, but I'll sprinkle favor on top of your frustration. Somebody shout, I'm graced for this. <laughs> so Paul said, uh, Jesus said, my grace, it's sufficient. For my strength is made perfect in your weaknesses. Uh, when you are at your lowest, my dunamis is exemplified in your astinia, in, in your weakest moment. You won't know anything about my power if you're still using your own power. So commit your interpretive realities, commit your hermeneutical and homiletical skills over to his grace. And Paul says, most gladly, most gladly therefore, Well, I rather glory in mine <laughs> infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He said, therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities. I take pleasure in my reproaches. I take pleasure in my necessities I, I take pleasure in my persecutions I take pleasure in my distresses for Christ's sake for when I am weak Then am I strong? And I don't know about it all this morning. But uh, so many times in my life, y'all, uh, I've been uh, attacked by evil. And, uh, but now I can testify when uh, the devil means it uh, for your bad. And, uh, the Lord, he means it uh, for your good. Do I have a witness uh, in the building? And, uh, when Satan is messing and uh, the Lord uh, he is blessing <laughs> yeah and I'm glad this morning uh, that so many times uh, in my life uh, I felt like uh, Andre Crouch uh, when he said uh, I've had uh, many tears uh, and sorrows uh, yes Lord uh, I've had question uh, for tomorrow uh, and uh, there have been times in my life you know, uh, when I felt uh, and I didn't right uh, from wrong uh, and, uh, but in every situation uh, yeah he gives me blessed consolation he lets me know that I am his own and, and I thank my God for my mountains yeah I thank God I thank God I thank God I thank God for my valley I thank him for the storm he's brought me through in God, all right, uh, yeah, cause if I never had any problems, uh, and, uh, I would not know uh, 
that God could solve them. Yes, Lord, I wouldn't know what faith in God's word can do. And why don't you shake a neighbor's hand and do this favor for me and tell your neighbor, neighbor, I've had my share of life's ups and downs. Ooh, I've had my share of being lying on. I'm walking the floor all night long. But my testimony is through it all. I've learned. I feel old school to trust in Jesus. Through it all tonight. I've learned to trust in God. Can you see? Oh, yeah. I got a close now. But I'm reminded of 2005, a hurricane called uh, Hurricane Katrina, she came through the Gulf Coast region, yeah, and that was a young boy who was being raised by his elderly grandmother in the ninth ward of New Orleans, yes, Lord, the boy's daddy had been killed in gang violence, and his mama died of AIDS virus, Yes, she did. And his grandma was raising her only grandchild in object poverty there in the ninth ward. They had a shotgun house. You could look through the roof and see the stars. Look through the floor and see the dirt. But Katrina came there and the waters were riding real high. The young man and his grandmama had to sleep the first night on the roof of that home. And the next morning, the cold guard brought a, a, a boat through the community, uh, took them off the roof of the house and took them down to the Montreal Convention Center uh, in downtown New Orleans. Uh, and, uh, they were there seeing people die, no food, but after five days, uh, a bus came from the city of Atlanta. Uh, and, it took the old lady and her grandson to Atlanta, Georgia. When they got to Atlanta, Georgia, that old lady went into an interview with some philanthropists from the 100 black men of, of Atlanta and from Emory University, from the Woodruff Philanthropic Organization. And, and when the old lady was interviewing, the young teenage boy was feeling suicidal. He had lost his faith and a belief in God. But when his grandmama came out of the interview, the grandmother was singing. She was whistling and had a smile on her face. And the young boy looked at his grandmama and said, how are you singing? We stripped from our home. We don't have a job. We don't have a roof over our heads. And then the old lady looked at her grandson and said, son, you don't understand but while I was in the interview, uh, I was meeting with some people from uh, Emory University. Uh, and, uh, and what they gonna do, boy? They gonna give me a job as a receptionist uh, in the Emory University Hospital. Uh, and they've already set aside my salary uh, of $75,000 a year uh, just to answer the phone and deliver messages. So, uh, the Woodruff Foundation is going to build us a brand new house. Son is going to have four bedrooms. Son is going to have two and a half bathrooms. We're going to have us a jacuzzi in the master bathroom. But if it had not been for the hell we've been through, if it for the wind and the rain we wouldn't be blessed the way we've been blessed I want you to shake a neighbor's hand and tell your neighbor all the hell you've been through God's going to use it to take you to another level so you got to give him glory because after every cloud the sun got to shine and he laying there in there anybody in here who want to give God some glory for I'm going higher Why don't you raise your hand to water heaven and tell him Anyway, you bless me Lord I'll be 
When you're going through hell uh, and the enemy is trying to kill you, uh, remember this. Uh, that's a midnight situation. Uh, midnight uh, is when the offering is low. Uh, midnight uh, is when the bank refuses to give you a loan. Uh, midnight uh, is when you feel like divorcing your wife. Uh, midnight is when you catch your hell in your ministry. Uh, anybody ever been through midnight? Uh, well, remember this. Uh, when you're going through midnight, uh, that midnight. Only lasts uh, for one minute. Uh, midnight only lasts uh, for 60 seconds. Uh, at midnight, uh, that's midnight. Uh, but at 12, uh, that's morning time. Uh, and why don't you shake a neighbor's hand uh, and say, neighbor, uh, keep on smiling. Uh, because we Give 